Ancient Greek philosophy has long been hailed as the predecessor to modern science, but you shouldn't think that just because the seeds of rationalism are sprouting, that doesn't mean that magical and supernatural beliefs were forgotten. Practices such as animal sacrifice and private magical rituals persisted well into the time of the Roman Empire, and famous pre-Socratic philosophers such as Pythagoras and Empedocles were even said to have had magical powers. Magical practices appear in the oldest works of Greek literature, and well-known tropes that began in this period, like the use of a wand, magical books, amulets, and a table covered with symbols, would become inseparable from the practice of magic throughout time. As historian Robert Parker says, magic differs from religion as weeds differ from flowers, merely by negative social evaluation. So what was the difference between the private practice of magic and the public practice of sacrifice? And how did magic influence philosophy? Well, that's what we're going to be talking about in today's video. Hey, I'm Matt, you're watching Nothing New, and today we're going to begin our exploration of the passionate and irrational side of ancient Greek life. Because while the rationalism of ancient Greece has been celebrated endlessly, they still believed in supernatural forces that caused divine madness, sent omens of the future, and inspired the poets and oracles. They also believed that they could interact with the divine. How exactly? That's what we're talking about in today's video. But first, if you want more content on ancient life and culture, consider subscribing. We have new videos coming out every week. Anyways, let's get into it. To truly understand how the ancients viewed the world, it's really important to understand the language they used to describe it. So many modern words have come down to us from Greek and Latin, but their meaning has often shifted throughout the years. For today's video, I want to give you just one great example, passion. In modern English, its general meaning is a strong, almost uncontrollable emotion. Today, we most often associate passion with love, but in ancient Greek, passion meant to suffer. Ever wonder why the final events in the life of Jesus is called the passion? This is the reason. In that context, it meant to suffer or endure. But why did the Greeks connect emotions to suffering? Well, another meaning for passion is to be acted on. But to make sense of this, we need to explore the difference between how the Greeks saw emotion and how we see it today. In the English-speaking world, when an emotion arises, we generally identify with it by saying, I am happy, or I am sad. An ancient Greek would never say that he was drunk and said he was possessed by the spirit of the vine, Dionysus. When panic runs through an army, it's brought on by the god of the wild, Pan. Love is Eros, war is Ares. All aspects of life had its associated deity. To be taken over by emotion was to be possessed by the gods. And while certain professions such as the poets and oracles made careers out of accessing divine madness and inspiration, in general, the passionate person was seen as a suffering person. Similarly, enthusiasm originally meant to be inspired by God's essence. As much as I'd love to flesh out the psychology of Greek spirituality or their philosophy of mind and emotions, I'm gonna have to save all of that for their own videos. I just needed to introduce these concepts now so you can really appreciate the idea of divine madness. While passion did have a connotation of suffering, and madness certainly doesn't seem desirable, in Plato's dialogue, The Phaedrus, Socrates says that, in reality, the greatest of blessings come to us through madness, when it is sent as a gift of the gods. For the prophetess at Delphi and the priestesses at Dodona, when they have been mad, have conferred many splendid benefits upon Greece, both in private and in public affairs but few or none when they have been in their right minds. And if we should speak of the Sibyl and all the others who by prophetic inspiration have foretold many things to many persons and thereby made them fortunate afterwards, anyone can see that we should speak a long time. And it is worthwhile to adduce also the fact that those men of old who invented names thought that madness was neither shameful nor disgraceful. Otherwise, they would not have connected the very word mania with the noblest of arts, that which foretells the future by calling it the Manic Art. Four types of divine madness are described in the Phaedrus. The first has just been described, the art of prophecy, said to be the gift of Apollo. Next is the mystical revelations that would occur during initiation into the various mystery religions of Greece, which was the gift of Dionysus. After that is poetic inspiration, the gift of the Muses. And finally, the madness of lovers from Aphrodite and Eros. We can see that 
Even though philosophy has almost always promoted the tempering of the passions, the irrational and passionate side of life was still deeply respected, as we can see by the praise Socrates gives to divine madness. It should also be apparent that the gods were deeply intertwined with day-to-day -day life. These weren't remote and abstract figures, and there's a lot of logic in things that seem crazy and irrational to us today, such as sacrifice. You could say it was ancient common sense that the gods were in the heavens above. Birds were the signs of the gods, lightning was from Zeus, and the sun and planets themselves were identified with the gods. That's why a sacrifice is burned, so that the smoke travels up to the gods and they may enjoy it. But where did sacrifice come from in the first place? Well, of course in actuality, the Egyptians and Mesopotamians practiced sacrifice long before the Greeks even hit the scene. However, in myth the practice was said to have come from Prometheus. Hesiod tells us the story, saying that, Prometheus pitted his wits against the mighty son of Kronos, for when gods and mortal men had a dispute at Macomb, he had carved up a big ox and served it in such a way as to mislead Zeus. For him he laid out meat and entrails rich with fat in the hide, covering it in the ox's stomach, while for men he laid out the ox's white bones, which he arranged carefully for a cunning trick by covering them in glistening fat. Then the father of men and of gods said to him, Son of Iapetus, most glorious of all lords, my good sir, how unfairly you have divided the portions. So said Zeus, whose wisdom is everlasting, rebuking him. But wily Prometheus answered him, smiling softly and not forgetting his cunning trick. Zeus, most glorious and greatest of the eternal gods, take whichever of these portions your heart within you bids. So he said, thinking trickery. But Zeus, whose wisdom is everlasting, recognized the trick and did not mistake it. And in his heart he thought mischief against mortal men, which was also to be fulfilled. With both hands he took up the white fat and was angry at heart, and wrath came to his spirit when he saw the white ox bones craftily tricked out, and because of this the tribes of men upon earth burn white bones to the deathless gods upon fragrant altars. But Zeus, who drives the clouds, was greatly vexed and said to him, Son of Iapetus, clever above all, so, sir, you have not yet forgotten your cunning arts. So spake Zeus in anger, whose wisdom is everlasting. And from that time, he was always mindful of the trick, and would not give the power of unwearying fire to the million race of mortal men who live on the earth. That's why Prometheus had to famously steal fire from the gods to give to humanity, making him one of the most famous heroes of Greek mythology. It may seem funny that humans got way more out of a sacrifice than the gods, and this humor was not lost on the Greeks. In fact, it was actually a common joke in Greek comedy. The typical sacrifice involved a domesticated animal, unless you were sacrificing to the huntress god Artemis, who preferred wild game. Male bulls, a symbol of Zeus, were the prime choice for sacrifice, though goats, pigs, and birds were also suitable. However, sheep appear to have been the most commonly sacrificed animal. The animal was cleaned, adorned with garlands and ribbons, and led by a girl with a basket of barley seeds to the temple. Hymns were sung, prayers were said, and libations were poured over the animal. The pouring of water on the head made the animal nod up, seemingly in agreement to the sacrifice. Their head would be pointed up towards the heavens, and its throat would be quickly slit from a knife that had been hidden in the barley basket. It was thought that animals were happy to be sacrificed, since it was important that everyone was a willing participant, humans, gods, and animals. The entrails, usually the liver, were inspected to see whether the gods accepted the sacrifice, and if so, the feast began. The animal was cooked at the altar, to the gods went the bones with some fat, spices, and sometimes wine, and the meat cooked and distributed to the people. In fact, the sacrificial ritual was almost certainly the only time an ancient Greek would eat meat. Thankfully, there were many reasons to hold a sacrifice. They would sacrifice to ask the gods for help, then again to thank them once they had been helped. They sacrificed at the Olympics and at their theater festivals, they sacrificed at weddings and of course during many religious rituals, and because they were the supremely self-confident Greeks, they did their sacrifices standing up and not prostrating like their neighbors, signifying that humans were closer to gods than animals. So that's a basic overview of the ancient practice of sacrifice. But what about magic? Magic had no place in the worship of the greater gods. Historian Arthur Fairbanks says, Magic was not at all foreign to Greek thought, but it was entirely foreign to the worship of the greater gods. Worship, in truth, was no more magic or barter than it was purely spiritual adoration. Though there was a long history of Greek interest and practice of magic, there was also a history of suspicion and fear directed at those who practiced magic. 
in contrast to religious rituals, which were seen as worshipping the gods, appeasing them, and maintaining the order which they had set out. Magic is seen as being manipulative of the divine. Whereas the religious practices were public occasions that sustained communities, magic was generally done for selfish reasons, for protection, for power, for health, for wealth. Just like astrology and fortune tellers today, it's all about basic human needs and desires. There were love spells, curses, self-improvement spells, healing spells, protection spells, and even spells for picking plants and herbs. One of the best sources we have for later Greek magic is the Greek Magical Papyri, a collection of papyrus texts that contain magical spells, formulas, hymns, and rituals. There is an incredible range of languages and influence found in these texts. The Greek Olympians sometimes take on attributes only found in their Egyptian counterparts, and sometimes Egyptian deities are referred to by Greek names. Spells have been helpfully translated, with the languages ranging from Greek to Demotic, the language which preceded Coptic, but also Aramaic and Hebrew. This was a time of religious syncretism, which is when people attempt to combine and harmonize two different religious traditions. Polytheists have always recognized that other cultures recognize the same gods more or less. They just had their own names for them. So religious conflict wasn't the issue it would become in Abrahamic religions. Jewish thinkers in the Hellenistic period and early Christian thinkers in the Roman period were heavily influenced by Greek thought and culture. Thinkers like Philo of Alexandria would use allegory to harmonize the Torah with Platonic and Stoic philosophy, and he's one of the reasons why philosophical terms like logos came into the Christian vocabulary, but he's a topic for another video. The point is that mercantile cities like Alexandria were places of intellectual flourishing. In fact, these texts were probably used by merchants, and that's why spells are written out in multiple languages. No matter who they met, they could translate the spell and ply their trade. In the Hellenistic period, an esoteric philosophy called Hermeticism arose, claiming to be the revealed teachings from a legendary combination of Hermes and Thoth, called Hermes Trismegistus, starting an esoteric tradition whose remnants can still be found in modern New Age thought. But I'm also going to have to save Hermeticism for a later video. So many topics, so little time. The Hellenistic period solidified well-known practices such as the use of amulets, curse figurines, magical drawings, formulas, incantations and handbooks. It was also during the Hellenistic period that the word magic was fully adopted from the Persian Magi, originally the priests of the Zoroastrian religion who famously featured in the Bible and when it gained a more negative connotation. Magical figures were common in Greek lore. Orpheus famously descended to the Greek underworld to bring back his dead wife, and philosophers such as Pythagoras and Empedocles were said to be magical themselves. Empedocles was said to be able to heal the sick, rejuvenate the old, influence the weather, and even summon the dead. Pythagoras was said to have been seen in two different places at the same time. A white eagle permitted him to stroke it, and a river even greeted him saying, Hail Pythagoras. Some say he also had a golden thigh. Yes, there is much more that has been attributed to Pythagoras than just mathematical theorems. In fact, he's one of the most interesting and esoteric of the pre-Socratic philosophers. Coming up next week, we're going to explore his philosophy of math mysticism and the spiritual side of his thought that isn't taught in math class. I hope you're excited, and I'll see you then.